So I do want to introduce the John H. Kirsten Moore Lecture Translational uh, Cancer Research Award, and it's not that far in the future. I guess my three button just got stuck. Uh, I think many of us were fortunate to have known Dr. Kersey. Uh, Dr. Kersey did essentially all of his training here at the University of Minnesota, and at the same time, uh, he did go away for a while to New York, but we don't count that against him. Uh, and he then established his career here uh, and established uh, his um, efforts around cellular therapies, particularly in pediatric malignancies. So this is a cover of cancer research when we were designated by the NCI as a comprehensive cancer center. I think many of you know that building that's featured there is the building, our first cancer research building, and obviously our second one is just across at CCRB. It's a picture of Dr. Kersey. I, I just pulled this up this picture as Dr. LaRusso and I were talking this morning about you. Do you remember the days before there were colony stimulating factors where everybody had to be in a negative pressure room? You had to put on a spacesuit to go interact with the patients. Uh, and I think Dr. Kersey was at the forefront of trying to understand how to manage severely uh, compromised patients during the course of time through their cancer therapy. So in many ways, Dr. Kersey and what he did was a uh, experimental phase one therapist with cellular therapies. And that leads to today's lecture uh, as Dr. Patricia LaRusso. Uh, I've had the great pleasure to know Dr. LaRusso over many years. She built a really exceptional phase one program at uh, the Carmanos Cancer Center at Wayne State University in Detroit. I had the opportunity to visit there. Uh, and I've always had, I probably have told you this, but I always said that is a model of how we should do experimental therapeutics in people and how we both engage the patients and the staff and give them really exceptional care. She then re moved to um, the Yale Cancer Center where she's a professor of medicine and associate cancer center director in experimental therapeutics. So I will turn the podium over Dr. LaRusso uh, to talk about her work in uh, new drug development. Thank you very much, thank you all for coming and especially thank you for inviting me. Um, this is quite an honor. Um, and I have known Doug Yee for quite a while, and I know a few of you. Uh, Naomi was in my uh, Vail course about a decade ago, and I've been very, very fortunate to uh, teach people at Vail over in Europe as well as in Australia and um, the Asian Pacific Rim, where we get a lot of amazing cases because of the uh, third world countries that we are involved with. But one of the things that was talked about this morning before I start is teams. And, you know, whenever anybody wants to congratulate me for the program that I created at Carmanos or one that I'm doing at Yale, I always have to tell them it's not my program. It's our program. It takes a team to do this. I always tell people that I'm just the conductor of the orchestra. And there are a lot of instrumentalists out there that I'm conducting. And if there wasn't a conductor, although they're phenomenal instrumentalists, they would probably make more noise than music if they were all playing independently in the same room. But by bringing the conductor on board and having them oversee the instrumentalists, they go from making noise to making music. And I kind of feel that clinical research and doing it the right way is akin to making music. And I've been very, very fortunate along the way in that I've been able to establish great teams. But as the first speaker talked about this morning, it's about dedication, but it's not only about dedication of the people on your team, it's about dedication of the institution and the leader for his people. And I think that's what has been pivotal in my success in the past. And I hope that that is what your institution resonates in terms of theories as well. I'm not really gonna talk about stuff that I have done because I mean, you know, I, I, I don't really like talking about myself that much. But what I wanted to do was talk about something that I think is near and dear and real for clinical researchers in oncology right now. And it's optimal dose determination in phase one clinical trials. Today at the FDA and Thursday, there's an entire two days of workshop on optimal dose determination. It is a real problem. And I'm hoping by the end of this talk today, you'll understand why and where we need to go in order to make it better. My disclosures. So in 1937, as you can see here, President Franklin D. Roosevelt actually 
um, put into legislation the National Cancer Institute. But it wasn't until 1971 that President Nixon, in declaring the war on cancer, decided to fund the National Cancer Institute somewhat independent of the National Institute of Health. And there he was in that room that day. And that was the nidus, that was one of the main nidises that brought us forward and helped accelerate cancer research as we know it today, especially clinical cancer research. And basically what he did is he declared a war on cancer. But unfortunately in 1971, it wasn't only about declaring it that was going to make the war on cancer become a reality in terms of us beginning to win that battle. Because in 1971, we were not really equipped with the necessary weapons that we needed to go to battle. 50 years later in, in 2000 or, or last year was the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Institute. And we have come a long way since then. And one of the slides that I bypassed that I wanna go over again is in 1971, as I said, we really didn't have the weapons that we needed. And it really wasn't until 32 years later when the human genome was sequenced uh, in large part by a friend of mine by the name of Jeff Trent and several others who were trying to win the race in, in the sequencing of the human genome. But it was that human genome that I, I personally believe has really set the stage for where we are in 2022 and hopefully in the future with additional weapons that we have put into place. And as you can see here, the percentage of drugs has really, really escalated. And in 2019, as you can see, 35% of all drugs that were developed were dedicated to oncology. And if we looked at CEDAR at the FDA's approvals by selected therapeutic areas over a five-year average, as well as 2021, what you identify is this outlier here, and that's oncology. Because as we begin to understand the science and as we develop the biologic and other tools that are necessary, we're now being able to develop better drugs, but we have a long way to go. We are definitely not there yet. In 1971, when Nixon declared the war on cancer, the molecular lights were essentially turned off. But in 2022, we're very fortunate that many of the molecular lights have been turned on, even though we need more lighting in, in the room. The old model back then in 1971, just like was discussed earlier today by our first speaker, is that when a patient had lung adenocarcinoma, that's essentially what they had. They had adenocarcinoma of the lung. And in fact, back in 1971, it was not the predominant cancer. When I was in training um, as a fellow, squamous cell was actually the most prevalent cancer. Now it's lung adenocarcinoma. But really, what does lung adenocarcinoma mean? It's just a histologic subtype. And we really don't treat as we used to um, many, many years ago. And in fact, the longevity of patients has significantly improved because many, many years have gone by and we've approached the new model of dividing cancer. And what was once lung adenocarcinoma is now a myriad of many different types of cancers that if we molecularly profile them, we can make great strides in overcoming and using our weapons to treat this disease. In the beginning, we predominantly had a tip of the iceberg, which was genomics. But what's happening now is the tip of the iceberg is getting larger as our scientific tools advance. And I don't know about you guys, but as I'm doing a lot of my clinical trials, it's not just about genomics, but more and more it's becoming transcriptomics. RNA sequencing is pivotal to a lot of what we wanna do, especially as we're developing immunotherapeutic tools and immunotherapeutic combinations. And proteomics, if it's done the right way, can really help us as well. But it is an emerging science, and there are many people that criticize it as an example, but there are many people who also, there are some people who know how to use it the right way. And combining all of these tools, especially with now epigenetics as well, is helping to transform how we understand the biology of the disease that we're trying to develop drugs for. And what's really, really important is not only forward translation, but reverse translation. 
When I first started out in the phase one arena, we just shot drugs into patients and we knew pharmacokinetics because of Jerry Collins, a good friend of mine, but we kind of like stopped with that. We found a maximum tolerated dose and we moved on. And we brought many of those drugs into the clinic for phase two and three based on what we might have seen in phase one predominantly. But it's not really that way anymore because it's so important to do reverse translation. It's not only important to go from bench to bedside, but it's probably more important to go from bedside back to bench so that we know we can cure millions of mice. But what is it about the patient's tumors that are preventing us from curing them or sustaining continual responses. And so those biopsies and the circulating tumor DNA and now circulating RNA and maybe proteomics in the future and many other tools are gonna to be pivotal for us as we advance. I am recently just completed a 92 patient randomized trial of Olaparib versus Olaparib plus atezolizumab in BRCA mutant breast cancer. And it was amazing. We had three serial biopsies that were required and we're really discovering quite a lot as a result of those serial biopsies. But it was amazing that even at NCI designated cancer centers, many of the patients maybe got biopsied, but they can't find the tumors. They never sent them in or they had an excuse for not wanting to biopsy. And I had to prevent that patient from going on study because those biopsies were pivotal. We already knew that Olaparib could treat BRCA mutant disease, but what was it about the tumor then growing and developing either acquired or having inherent resistance that prevented us from long-term durable responses? Pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics are pivotal to what we do. And pharmacodynamics is almost superseding pharmacokinetics because of its importance relative to the biology. But keep in mind, we need to know drug exposure so that we can really understand the dynamics of what is happening, not only to the tumor anymore, but also to the tumor microenvironment. Back in the olden days, pharmacodynamics was there, but it was really, really small because mainly what we were doing were cytotoxics. Today, pharmacodynamics is pivotal and also predictive biomarkers are becoming extremely important. Just to show you how important biomarker studies are, looking at the number of publications between 1980 and 2021, over 55,000 publications in 2021 referred to, farm, uh, to biomarker studies within the content of their clinical trial. So the question is, if we're developing agents based on scientific discoveries, and we have a better understanding of both the drug targets and are drugging them, how does that impact the old phase one paradigm of how we used to do clinical drug development? Well, first we have to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of doing a phase one trial? Well, we always think, and we do know, and it's still, that it's important for us in a phase one trial to determine the safe dose and a preliminary toxicity profile because the subset of patients is so limited that it's just preliminary, as well as pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. More and more we're realizing that not only gender, but importantly, race is very important in getting a better picture of a more relevant population over and above just the Caucasian population is extremely important for pharmacokinetics. But the outcome is usually we define these preliminary toxicities and dose limiting toxicities and drug exposure. And then what we do is we go on to recommend based on first cycle pharmacokinetics, a, um, a recommended phase two dose that we advance forward. But it isn't always that easy. So our phase one trials are various cohorts. And then what we typically do is we have an expansion cohort and we'll start with dose level one and we'll go up to the maximum dose that we want and have many, many, sometimes multiple arms after an expansion to not only identify additional safety parameters, but also preliminary signs of, of efficacy. And along the way, we identify toxicities, which are gonna help us define a maximum tolerated dose. But hopefully before we even get there, we've identified a pharmacodynamic, we've identified the pharmacodynamic effects that we were looking for. And as we then escalate above the pharmacodynamic effects, we hopefully will get responses if our drug is true to the target. And this pharmacodynamic, the preliminary evidence of pharmacodynamic effects 
and up subsequent effects will hopefully help us define a biologically effective dose. And before that biologically effective dose, we define a subtherapeutic range. But what we're finding more and more is that we don't only have a therapeutic dose. We don't only have that maximum tolerated dose that we need to keep in mind, but we have a therapeutic range of doses. And we're gonna be looking at this in the next several minutes and why understanding that therapeutic range is important, not only in the treatment of metastatic disease, but also in the treatment of in the adjuvant setting and hopefully in prevention for high-risk patients such as BRCA mutant patients that maybe want to maintain their ovaries for a while because they're young and they want to have children or they're not ready to have bilateral mastectomies and oophorectomies and maybe may not even have to if we get the drugs right. Sorry about that, I'm going the wrong way. So basically what we don't want, we don't want too toxic of a drug where the toxicity supersedes the pharmacodynamic and effective doses. That, that's a dead drug for us. But what we do want is a well-behaved drug that we can subsequently move to phase two. And typically, like I said, we define our dose limiting toxicity in that cycle one. But more and more with the drugs that we're developing, we need to redefine how we define our evaluation period, primarily for toxicity, but how we also have to incorporate efficacy in those trials. There was a recent study that was published a few years ago by the Princess Margaret Group, looking at delayed immune-related adverse effects in assessment for dose-limiting toxicity in early phase immunotherapy trials. They looked at 352 trial enrollments, and they identified that the median time to first onset of clinically significant adverse events was significantly shorter amongst patients receiving combination relative to single agent therapies. But most all of our drugs are developed first as single agents. But what they did find out was that about 6% of patients that were enrolled experienced clinically significant adverse events beyond cycle one. And as you can see here, the majority of all adverse events in their study looking at um, immunotherapeutic early phase trials occurred well beyond phase one, 85% of their toxicities. And they concluded that although many of these clinically significant adverse events were delayed well beyond the dose limiting toxicity period, it was important to collect as well as report those delayed effects as they may provide further refinement of both dosing and scheduling through the drug development process. So the question is, are we even getting the dose right in phase one? When I was a young investigator, probably younger than Naomi actually, um, I did a retrospective study looking at cytotoxic therapies that subsequently went to phase three trials. And at that point, I identified that over 50% of all doses of cytotoxics that went into phase three had to be dose reduced after cycle one or cycle two because of toxicities. I would have thought we would have gotten it right by now. But this was a study that uh, Uday Banerjee's team did at, um, at um, Royal Marsden. And what they did is they looked at 90 oncology drugs that were FDA approved. And as you can see here, 28 small molecules and six of them were targeted antibodies. So some of these drugs got approval for more than one indication. And what they identified was that there were significantly increased grade three, four adverse events with small molecules over monoclonal antibodies in phase three trials. That 40% of small molecules had significant toxicities and had to be dose reduced in phase three. And because of some of the toxicities in phase three, 9% of the studies had to be discontinued. When you think that an average phase three trial is well over 100 to $150 million, and there are a lot of patients whose lives are depending on those studies, that's a lot of lives and a lot of money that could be wasted. What they identified was that 45% of patients on small molecules required dose modifications due to drug toxicity in phase three trials. And there were 48% that required interruptions and 42% that required reductions. And really the small molecule doses that advanced forward that had the greatest success were those that advanced forward at doses that were identified and moved forward 
that were below the maximum tolerated dose that was identified in those phase one trials. So the question is, how can we avoid pushing the wrong dose forward? Well, assessment of the recommended phase two dose and expansion cohort we think is pivotal. And we do at least 12 to 20 patients in those expansion cohorts to help identify. Many times, however, it's hard to recruit patients to those expansions if we didn't see response rates as we were escalating or even at the dose that we were expanding. And potentially more than one dose needs to be assessed in those phase one trials, spending more time in phase one so that we get it right when we go to phase two and phase three. And considerations for assessing toxicities beyond cycle one is something that is very difficult for many of us to push with pharma when we're doing pharma studies, but something that's very necessary and that we try to put our foot down over and over again. There was another study that Brock did, and it was basically a uh, statistical analysis where he used um, non flexible nonlinear regression models to look at whether or not we were really doing efficacy, a service or a disservice in phase one trials. Basically, what he felt was, especially with these drugs that we think are therapeutically beneficial, are we getting the dose right, not only for toxicity, but also are we looking at preliminary efficacy? And he examined about 122 manuscripts and identified about 115 scenarios that he could look at for both dose limiting toxicities as well as objective response rates. And what he identified was that there was a true linear assessment or a true linear assessment of dose versus toxicity, and that the more drug you gave, the greater the toxicity was. And most of those studies were looking at response rate as the efficacy outcome. But what he also identified was that as you gave more dose in these early phase trials, you didn't necessarily increase efficacy. So the question was, was were we doing justice to monotonic efficacy as we were doing justice to monotonic toxicity? And the objective response outcomes routinely failed to show the strength of the relationship with dose, shown by dose limiting toxicity outcomes. And overall in those trials, except for monoclonal antibodies or antibody drug conjugates, he felt that the trials failed to assess monotonic efficacy endpoints. And should we now be redesigning phase one trials with two co-primary endpoints rather than just the primary endpoint of dose limiting toxicity or recommended phase two dose? And questioning whether or not the surrogate marker of response rate is relevant in terms of identification of efficacy in these trials, especially as with phase two, three trials, the FDA is moving away from response and going to survival outcome or progression-free survival. How are we looking at that in our early phase trials, or are we just going so fast that we wanna get that toxicity so that we can move forward? And I think a really good trial was the Keno 10, where when Merck identified Pembro as an effective dose, moving into their preliminary non-small cell lung cancer study, they looked at two doses, 10 milligrams Q3 weeks, as well as two milligrams Q3 weeks, relative to the standard of care arm dose of taxol. And what they identified is when you have an appropriate marker like PDL1 and you look at the right the appropriate proportion score, there is really no difference between the two and the 10 milligram dose. And so they not only moved the two milligram dose forward in subsequent trials, but eventually gave a standard just flat dose of I believe 200 milligrams a day. And biomarkers are becoming more and more important. And this is a study that we did with GenMab 1046, which is a 41BB PDL1 duo body um, agent. And basically, what we did is we looked at multiple doses from 25 milligrams to 1200 milligrams because the drug was relatively non toxic. But thank God we did biomarker assessment because if anybody knows, 41BB is an agonist. This was a 41BB PDL1 uh, duo body. And it's an agonist. So one of the things you always worry about is are you going to get to a point with receptor occupancy that you're almost 
doing harm rather than good. And what we identified was that we did see this cutoff, as you can see here, although there were small numbers in these cohorts because it was a phase one trial, but we saw a consistent pattern that once we got beyond 140, we actually were doing more harm than good as a biomarker in terms of receptor occupancy and more was not necessarily better. And subsequently, we moved forward with that dose into an expansion cohort, looking at various non-small cell lung cancer cohorts. This is another drug that I've been recently interested in, and it's the MDM2 P53 antagonist by Boringer Ingelheim that is actually moving forward into randomized phase three trials. Actually, it's got an interesting history because I remember one day being on vacation, sitting at my daughter's dining room table in South Carolina for a safety call. And everybody was like putting all these patients on this phase one trial. And I was kind of really lagging behind. And so, you know, Yale University was looking pretty lousy because we only had three or four patients and everybody else had, you know, six, seven patients on study. But what they were doing was they were putting all different types of patients on trial. They weren't looking for MDM2 amplification or P53 status of their tumors. And I remember being so angry and I asked the team, I said, okay, you guys, if this was your daughter or your wife, and you didn't know the MDM2 or P53 status, would you be putting your wife or daughter on this trial? And they were all men except for me. And they all, there was dead silence. And I said, how can we be developing a drug in 2020 without looking at the known biomarker that's going to help us predict? I don't know about any of you guys that put patients on clinical trials, but I can guarantee you that none of my patients go on clinical trials because they want to fill a cohort. They go on trials because they want to live. And I think that's probably the same with all of your patients. We owe our patients. We owe our patients the biology behind the drug to better understand not only toxicity, because we know these drugs are toxic, MDM2 targeted drugs are toxic. We owe them the chance of response and that day we changed the face of that trial and only patients with MDM2 amplifications were subsequently put on that trial. I thought they were going to close my site. I thought I really excused the French pissed off the medical monitor of the study, but I really changed the face and we kind of also amended the trial. We looked at two different schedules. We looked at it two different doses. It's got a phenomenal half-life. It's got a huge half-life. We only dose it once every 21 days. And what we identified is that we identified in this trial the typical toxicities that were hematologic, but we didn't really get them as early as we anticipated based on the seven or eight other MDM2 inhibitors that had gone forward. And because we were looking for MDM2 amplification, we really enrolled a lot of sarcoma patients because a lot of them have MDM2 amplification. As you can see here, the genomic landscape for well and D-differentiated liposarcoma is huge relative to other tumor types. And what we identified subsequent to changing the landscape of patient enrollment, we saw a lot of responses. And we saw a lot of responses regardless of what the dose was. And that changed the face of where we're going with that drug. And actually now what we're looking at is an optimal phase two dose as we move into the randomized phase three trial. We were able to really go from phase one to truly phase three because of the way we rethought the recruitment of our patients. Another drug that all of you are probably familiar with is Sataracib, which was FDA approved at 960 milligrams daily. And as you can see here, almost all patients that were put on this trial that had KRAS G12C, because thank God it was a requirement for protocol entry, had some degree of response, regardless of whether or not it was 180 or 960 milligrams. What was also interesting is if you dissected out the non-small cells, you even got a much more beautiful waterfall plot. But what was interesting about this drug and we needed to think about was when you looked at the pharmacokinetics and here the kinetics was pivotal, you did not see linear pharmacokinetics. Regardless of what dose you gave, the pharmacokinetics was superimposable. What was also very interesting is that the half-life of the drug was only five hours, and yet they're only dosing it once a day. 
And we have to ask ourselves, is that the right schedule that moved forward to FDA approval? And also, do we need to give 960 milligrams? If you look across the board, the toxicity was very similar, maybe slightly more at the higher dose. But we needed a KRAS G12C inhibitor. Advocates were pushing for it, physicians were pushing for it, patients needed it. And so they did approve the drug at 960 milligrams, but they have made Amgen go back to a substudy of code break 100. Because there are nonlinear pharmacokinetics and objective responses are seen regardless of dose, they made Amgen go back and do this study and they may change the dose in the package insert and may have to reformulate drug based on this, this study, which is ongoing, looking at 240 milligrams and 960 milligrams. Do we really need 960 milligrams because delayed toxicities are greater at that dose than at the lower dose and efficacy, at least preliminarily in phase one was relatively similar. And hopefully this trial will help prove whether or not we need to continue on with the higher dose. There's another drug I wanna talk about before I start asking you all questions. And this was a study that was presented a couple of weeks ago at AACR by Tim Yap and colleagues. It was the Petra study, which is looking at the first most advanced PARP1 selective inhibitor and what they also did is they looked at it, not in all comers, but only in patients that had defects in the homologous recombination pathway, BRCA1, BRCA2, HALB2, RAD51C, and RAD51D. This drug is amazing. When you look at the preclinical data, what you see is it's extremely PARP1 selective, as you can see here, relative to some of the older drugs like telazoparib, olaparib, and even viliparib, which never really got to FDA approval. What you also see is biologically, the parallation of this drug supersedes any of the first generation PARP inhibitors. Not only is it you know, a phenomenal drug in terms of PARP1 selectivity, but it does what it needs to do biologically. And what's even more profound is, if you look at the preclinical tox data, it is devoid of any heme tox. And any of you that have used a laparib know that oftentimes you have to dose reduce because of the anemia and sometimes even the leukopenia that you get. And sometimes you have prolonged delays in retreatment, which could affect tumor response. And so they recruited patients onto this study that had even had prior PARP inhibitors, as well as the majority of patients had seen prior platinums and had progressed. And what they saw across the board, regardless of dose, was response, as you can see in this waterfall plot. And even in patients that had had prior PARP inhibitors and had progressed, as you can see here, regardless of whether or not they were PARP inhibitor naive or exposed, there was significant response. But what we did not see were complete responses in this study. But the question is, is were, did we lack complete responses because the median number of prior treatments was four to six, the majority had seen PARP inhibitors, the majority had become resistance to platinum, and perhaps if we had moved this drug earlier in an expansion cohort, we may have started seeing those complete responses that we definitely wanted. But one of the things I think is a take home is that the duration of re clinical benefit, regardless of PARP exposure or not, was profound and many patients remained on treatment well beyond the cutoff date. And so does partial incomplete response mean something more than duration of clinical benefit, especially in an early phase clinical trial? Do we need to redefine our surrogate endpoints of response? And many of us are looking at that. This drug, amazing. It's, it's um, effective, target effective concentration was exceeded with the first dose, with the first cohort. And if you looked at TEC relative to all of the other PARP inhibitors, it superseded all of them, even at the first cohort. A phenomenal drug. And when you looked at the biomarkers in these patients, even at the first cohort, there was correlation below what we needed to get that effective dose based on preclinical modeling. And that correlation beyond the first cohort lasted through day six when they really started doing cycle one, day one, after the cycle zero dosing. Minimal toxicities. 
So this is a beautiful drug, but regardless of whether or not they gave five milligrams or 400 milligrams, the, the toxicities were really minimal and the efficacy was across the board. So the beauty of this drug is how you can probably use it in combination because of the dose range. But the challenge is, what are the doses that you're gonna move forward in phase two and subsequent phase three? But even with a low dose with no toxicity, this to me is a perfect drug for cancer interception in those patients that have those germlines that have a high probability of developing a disease, but are very young and want some semblance of a family or do not yet, are not yet ready for definitive surgery. So the unmet need in clinical drug development in oncology is to transform our early clinical trials to become more informative. Establishing the recommended phase two dose, especially for molecularly targeted agents, is an imperfect science. There's chronic prolonged administration of drugs, unlike chemotherapy. There's limited dose limiting toxicity assessment period because unfortunately, companies are still using first cycle. The dose limiting toxicities often occur beyond cycle one. How many of us, as an example, have gotten profound anemia with the laparib in cycle two or cycle two day seven, as an example? Repeated and prolonged grade two toxicities may become intolerable. Everybody blows off grade two fatigue. I don't know about you, but I'm getting pretty old and grade one fatigue really bothers my lifestyle. I can't imagine a poor patient living with grade two fatigue. In many phase one targeted therapies overestimate the recommended phase two dose. So there's three considerations for dose selection in early phase oncology trials. Use all your available preclinical and clinical data for dose selection decisions. Do not expect a single confirmed dose with many of these drugs. And consider formal dose evaluation in phase two trials. Two doses maybe, advance them forward. So what are the pivotal questions I think we need to ask our phase one investigators? Instead of an MTD focus, should we be identifying the safest dose with the best response? Regarding maximum tolerated, regarding MTA clinical development, are we moving into an era of molecularly targeted agent clinical drug development? Are we moving into an area where we need to identify a greater database in the early phase of clinical development? And if so, what parameters do we need to look at or look for? In the area of molecularly targeted agents and IO agents, is more necessarily better? Many times it isn't. Traditionally, phase one clinical trials have identified the maximum tolerated dose. But we have to ask ourselves in 2022, at what expense are we doing that in terms of both toxicity as well as cost? At about $150,000 to $200,000 per patient that go on phase one trials, I don't know about you guys, but I've looked at my budgets and a cycle one for many of my studies is between seventy-five dollars and $125,000. Just for cycle one, I would rather use that money in other ways like helping patients get on to phase one trials? And should we be redefining what doses we are seeking in these trials as patients are staying on these agents longer, looking more for an optimum biologic dose or long-term tolerated dose? What dose should we advance forward? And how do we use these doses in combination? And how will they impact the development of resistance? And will less equal a decrease in disease control duration Nobody's really answered that question with many of the drugs that we're moving forward. And will we be developing multi-dose comparative trials? And can we use PK and or PD to guide personalized dosing where we look at periodic trough levels to assure adequate exposure or look at CT DNA to help guide how we're going to move those drugs in terms of increasing the dose when we start seeing signals that the patient may be developing resistance. Our commonly used surrogate measures in early phase trials are response rates. But how do these surrogate endpoints translate into more definitive endpoints in the long run, like overall survival? The dose does make the poison, but do you need the drug to become a poison to have response? Well, today I told you the workshop is ongoing for Project Optimize. Last year, Rick Pazder, who trained me, by the way, I was a mentee of his when I was a fellow for four and a half years, 
until he moved to MD Anderson and told me I had to become a faculty. Basically, last year he was quoted as saying, step back, slow down, you guys, and find the right dose. And therein lies Project Optimize, the workshop that's being held today and Thursday. And with that, I thank you. And I have a special thanks to all the patients, caregivers, investigators, and scientists who have helped to arm all of us with the necessary weapons to help fight this war. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. LaRusso. We have about 10 minutes for questions. And I might be the one hopping around because I don't see, uh, we, I see a couple hands up. So I'm going to run over this way. I see a hand over here. I'm coming to you first. I'm just going in with the people. All right. Here's our question over here. Talking to the mic as close as you can. Hi, Dr. Luru. So uh, great talk. Um, my question for you is, this is going to require a fairly major paradigm shift in terms of how patients are being treated. And I'm wondering if you see any patient quality of life parameters being included in those sort of endpoints that are being looked at in studies and how you think the field might shift in that direction. So you're talking about PROs. So, you know, we don't really focus yet on PROs the way we need to, but I think that's coming soon. Because actually, I think that if we look more at the right dose, we may actually improve their quality of life. I do agree. I know none of my patients enjoy getting biopsies, but I think that if you spend the time, and in our center, my team, I have five phase one docs, myself and four young gentlemen. Maybe one day I'll get a female too. But, you know, we don't allow our CRCs, our study coordinators, or our research nurses to consent patients. We do it ourselves. Because we really need to explain to the patients why we're doing the biopsies and what the biology is behind the biopsies. And I can tell you all of my patients, even those that, you know, you would think that because they're not as educated may not understand, when you explain it to them, they understand. But one thing I'll let you know is I don't take a lot of risk. Sometimes, you know, you have to, but I, I try to not take those risks if I don't have to. There's nothing worse than dropping a patient's lung and having them in the hospital with a chest tube for a week. That isn't quality of life. But there are a lot of patients that you can serially biopsy and you can do it in a meaningful way. And I think as we develop some of these other surrogate tools, I think they're gonna be pivotal. Um, and you know, Laura Esserman is down here in the audience and I'm sure she's looking at CT DNA relative to the genomics and the transcriptomics of the tumor itself. Because I think we need to better understand that in real time if we're gonna use these surrogates to map treatment response or what happens to the patients. But I think phase one, if you do it right in phase one, you may be able to spare the patients in phase two and three especially in phase three. But if you don't do it and you're only guessing, then you're worse off for a few patients having to have some alteration in their quality of life, you're sparing a multitude of patients, potentially. And I think that's what's important as we explain it to the patients. All right, we have another question over here. I'll get you, Laura. Hi, um, I am <clears throat> curious where preclinical disease models fit into this optimal dose determination in clinical trials. Do you think that large animal disease models could help better predict ah. PK and PD um, and tissue penetration in these steady state models? So do you have a veterinary school here? Uh, yes, we do. Okay. So, you know, that's, that's been, it's, it's first of all, for IO agents, it's really, really challenging because they're human, I mean, they're human specific. But if we're talking about molecularly targeted agents, um, you know, preclinical models only help us so much. And one of the things I discussed at AACR was preclinical models for combination strategies in early phase trials. We don't have good preclinical models to help us with combination strategies. So I ran the KRAS symposium at AACR, 
And there are a lot of preclinical models that show us there are, but they're primarily mice. Um, we're not really doing combination strategies in monkeys, and we don't use MT, we don't use monkeys for MTAs. It's just mice and dogs. But the problem is, is the preclinical models show us that they're safe and that we can give these combinations and they're gangbusters relative to monotherapies, but we're not getting it right in patients. We're not getting it right in patients. So one of the things I would like to do, I'm waiting for some funding to come through. I put in a large grant. I'm praying to God that I get it, but it's pretty high risk for whoever funds it. You know, proteomics, I think, is a very unique tool. Not everybody does it the right way. Laura Esserman's team does. Proteomics can help us with two things. It can help us to find phosphorylated markers, active functional markers, because actually when you're giving a targeted therapy, you're looking at genomics, but what you're targeting is protein. You're not, you know, that's what you're targeting. You're targeting protein. But there's something else that phosphoproteomics can do. And nobody has really keyed into this yet. And you probably can laugh at me, but please do it after I leave the room. One thing that phosphoproteomics can do is it can quantitate. It can quantitate the functional characteristics of the tumor. So it not only gives you functionality of the mutational aberration, but it can hopefully quantitate. So do you need to push both drugs to toxicity or are we going to become personalized one day where we're going to use something like phosphoproteomics and we're not only going to get our targets and drugs that we're going to use based on functionality of the proteins, but we're also going to be able to do drug ratios based on the degree of quantitation of those functional aberrations because we don't really have good preclinical models. But one of the things we don't use enough of our dogs and dogs have cancer, but most, most caregivers of dogs don't want to pay what it costs to do the clinical trials, to put them on the clinical trials to get the answers right. And that's extremely expensive, but maybe that is another alternative, especially for combination strategies. Laura, you had a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just wondering, <clears throat> for things that are effective, but toxic, should we go back to phase one? Can we go from phase three to phase one? And you know, we've talked about sometimes doing more clever work in phase two, which we can, but I think it's challenging sometimes to do it that way. And so, for example, um, we're certainly seeing you know more as we see better efficacy with the IO drugs in the early stage setting where people have more intact immune systems. You know, we're probably overdosing people. We need to think about combinations and trying different types of drugs. And rather than trying all these different doses in phase three, should we go back to phase one? Is there, is there, a, is there a setting where we can like keep going around in a circle and keep improving things? When you see an effect, great. I, you can still give someone an opportunity, but you've got to do that really careful dose monitoring. What do you think? Oh, no, I do agree with you. So I don't know if everybody heard the question, but, you know, in drugs that prove themselves too toxic, like the 9% discontinuation rate with those molecularly targeted phase three trials, should we be going back to phase one and going back to the drawing board? <clears throat> I don't know what's going to happen at this workshop, but I've been following Project Optimize quite closely. And I think what we're going to have to, you're right, I think we're going to have to go back to phase one. But when we go back to phase one, we're going to be designing those phase one trials differently than the original phase one trials that led that drug to phase three to begin with. I think you're still going to call it phase one, but you're going to have different endpoints of what you're going to be looking at. Schedule, dose. I think the more we understand biomarkers, I, one of the trials that I'm working on right now um, and I'm working on it with a group of clinical investigators is, you know, how do we get drugs earlier to the patients as well? So with a lot of the phase three trials, we can go front line, but then we run into a lot of problems and, you know, people are hesitant once we're giving frontline metastatic patients these phase three trials or drugs that are proven toxic. 
We need to, it costs a lot of money to go back. It costs a lot of money to go back. And depending on what company you're working with and what their pipeline is, many times they're not gonna pay for it. They'd rather go to something that is a better bet for them. Maybe this is where like something like the NCI's early phase program should say, we want to do this. We wanna go back with these drugs and prove it. But the other thing I think we need to take a leap of faith on is how do we, you know, we're not really identifying and understanding IO biomarkers to the degree that we need to. So one of the trials that we're working on right now, and hopefully we're going to move forward, um, we're meeting every two weeks as a think tank is, you want the backbone of checkpoint inhibitor therapy because it is the backbone. But how do you decide what patients or what drugs you should be including for which patients? And there is a lot with immunofluorescence and Cytoff that we're not using. And there are a couple really, really good biomarker strategists like Kurt Schelper, like Kojo and others that can help us, we think. And so what we wanna do is have this trial where we have the immune checkpoint backbone, we biopsy the patients at the time, we run them through in real time. So we're gonna need a few really good labs and maybe in the middle of cycle one or the beginning of cycle two, we add on and we look at those biomarkers as we're developing them. That, I mean, that's, but you're right. I think we need to go back to the drawing board with some of these drugs, because I think we're losing out on some very good drugs that we once had that we didn't know how to understand or were too toxic because we started developing them the wrong way. Any other question? Pat, I got one, Pat. Oh, yeah, sorry. So can I ask you what your thoughts are around pharmacogenomics and drug development? And I always think about this, and you made the comment about race or ancestry. And I think, you know, we've all seen differences when phase one trials are done in Japan versus the United oh, yeah. States versus Europe. So should that roll in earlier, or will you just pick everything up with PDPK? Um, you know, I think... It may be drug dependent, but I think that it should roll in earlier. And one of the other things that the FDA is pushing, in fact, you know, Eli Lilly brought on an immune checkpoint inhibitor that was developed in China. And they brought, they, um, they had 96% Chinese and 4% others. And it was a really good immune checkpoint inhibitor. It was as good as any others, but the FDA vetoed it because the FDA wants heterogeneous populations. And honestly, um, I think there's a huge push right now that the FDA is demanding, and I think, or they're asking, I think eventually they will be demanding. In fact, I'm very, very fortunate in that I put a grant out that I received. Um, it'll be announced in a few weeks at ASCO. It's a hybrid decentralization model. Um, you know, Connecticut, the state of Connecticut has some of the wealthiest people in the United States. And they also have some of the poorest people in the United States. And close to 40% of the population in Connecticut lives below the poverty line. And there's two areas of concentration, one in Hartford and one in Bridgeport, that have over 45% underrepresented minorities. And so the grant that I got, and um, it was only one and a half million dollars, and to do something like this, with the operation, the clinical trials operations component you need. I was very blessed in that I've currently got four sponsors at one and a half million dollars each and a fifth one hopefully will be signing in the next couple of weeks to be able to bring my program into those underrepresented communities. When we first opened up our KRAS G12C phase one trial and there were no FDA approved drugs, there were five underrepresented minorities that were referred to me from Hartford in a month. And only one of those patients could make it. The other four had social and structural determinants of health that we didn't have the resources to overcome. Those four patients are dead. The fifth patient is still in remission on her KRAS G12C inhibitor four years, four and a half years later. So I think it's you know, I'm an old lady and you know, I don't need publications as much as anybody else does, like many of you young ones in the, in, the, um, in the audience. But what I do feel is an obligation for those patients. I grew up in the inner city of Detroit. Um, when I grew up, when I was a kid, both my parents died of cancer before I was 17. And I distinctly remember us not having enough money because back then we had to pay for blood transfusions. They weren't covered with health insurance. We couldn't get my mother blood transfusions. 
She died of lymphoma. She died horribly anemic. I was one of those kids that grew up in the inner city that was able to make a break of it. I remember my counselor in high school telling me that women don't become doctors, they become nurses. That counselor eventually became my patient and died of metastatic prostate cancer. But, you know, I'm white and I was one of those poor white people, poor white kids, but there are a lot of minorities that just don't have the resources. We need to reach out to them. And for me, because I'm older and I don't need another publication, but I do need to prove whether or not, if we implement this paradigm, will it be successful? That's my last hurrah before I retire in four years. If I can pull this off, then I can say that I've really done something. But we need to understand the genomics and the pharmacokinetics of those patients. They're different. I developed ARESA ZD1839. It was the first drug that a sponsor gave me because who wanted to give pharma-sponsored studies to this no-name in the inner city of Detroit who had this you know, beginning phase one program? But Judy Oaks at AstraZeneca took a chance on me. And I remember when we opened it up to Japan, it killed the drug because they all got, many of them got interstitial pneumonitis and nobody understood it. And it was because of the pharmacogenomic differences between Asians and Caucasians who were the majority of patients that we had recruited up to that point. And I'm sure we, as we bring on more underrepresented minorities and people of color, we will see more differences. The problem is we've never given ourselves the opportunity to do so. All right, and we have another question right over here. I often think that cancer centers are outdated. The cancer center idea. Back in the olden days when there was nothing, we needed cancer centers. But now what's happening is so many patients are treated in the community that these cancer centers need spokes into the communities to be able to be more effective and treat the masses of people. So I know that probably the interim director is probably going to shoot me because I chaired the, the BSC for the NCI, but I do believe that we need to think about how can we restructure cancer centers to make them more effective. Sorry, yes. Hi, Dr. Laroso. excellent talk. I have a question uh, regarding the targeted therapy that you uh, pointed out. Um, I work at EGFR, which is a driver gene um, in lung adenocarcinoma. Based on my experience, um, when we are talking about targeting a protein, we basically inhibit their phosphorylations or their functions. We're not removing from the system. And as a result of that, that particular protein may acquire secondary mutation, which cause resistance at a later time point. That's exactly what so what do you think um, we should focusing on? Should we think about targeting a driver genes or removing them from the cancer cells and try to I don't know mitigate how we... the resistance? Um... I'm not smart enough to know how we could even do that. But right now, the only tools we have is targeting the proteins that will eventually develop resistance because of developing additional. I don't know. Is I don't even know. Laura, I mean, Laura can do it because she can remove the tumor and everything's gone. Or she can treat the tumor and it goes away in the adjuvant. I don't know. The, what? You're trying to get rid of your... Yeah. Right, wouldn't that be nice? I know, I know. A combo that's near and dear to my heart, ACT. I, when I was a junior fellow, I spent four and a half years as a fellow, three and a half in the lab. One of my jobs, I might have met Doug around that time, was helping to formulate Taxol. But the other job was to figure out whether or not we could give Taxol in combination. So I worked pretty diligently in preclinical models developing ACT that became the standard of care with the NCI and subsequently. But wouldn't it be nice if we could get rid of that? Yeah, no, I don't know how we can do it. It would be nice, though. Any other questions? Anyone else with a question from the audience? If not, thank you all so very, very much. I appreciate your time, and thank you for inviting me.